The Indian tribes of the Columbia River each have a legend about the creation of Mount St. Helens. One version tells of two sons of the Great Spirit fighting for the love of beautiful Lewitt. In their wrath, they hurled fire at one another. The sky was blackened and the river dried up. The creator became angry and transformed them into mountains. Lewitt was also punished. She too became a mountain, but the creator promised her even though he must punish her with a long icy sleep, she would still be beautiful. But the slumber was not to last. Amid the spring breezes, the sleeping goddess began to stir. The 9,700 foot peak first began with deep rumblings. Earthquakes were monitored with growing frequency. Scientists and geologists talked excitedly about the mountain. Monitoring stations were set up to measure and watch and anticipate, but mostly to watch. Eight, four, five. Limited experience, limited predictions. As activity continued, scientists talked guardedly about possible eruptions. Then, on March 27th, it came. Confirmation. Lewitt, Mount St. Helens, still had fire. The first venting of steam and ash. Within the next few weeks, fissures and minor avalanches were reported. Ventings of steam and ash carved a crater, then a second. And, as the mountain shook off her sleep, the two craters became one, creating a saddle-shaped peak. Excited talk and study gave way to emergency plans. Parts of the mountain were evacuated as precautionary measures. Roadblocks went up. From the United Press. Geologists began to focus on one particular part of the mountain, the north flank, where an ominous bulge had begun to grow and continued to grow at the rate of five feet a day. Geologists speculated about pressure building inside the mountain. Spirit Lake, which lies directly below the danger area, was evacuated. Most residents left willingly, realizing the dangers. Others were not so willing. 84-year-old Harry Truman was the not so willing. Truman, operator of the St. Helens Lodge, had spent much of his life on the mountain. During those evacuation days, Truman's reputation as a stubborn, crusty, whiskey-drinking diehard grew as rapidly as his refusals to leave. He hasn't hurt anything yet. It's no damage. There's, on our side, the north side, it's left me alone entirely. I'm on the northeast side. There's no rock, no ash, or nothing on my side. I had some people yesterday ask me why the hell I stay there and what am I doing up there. That's my life. Spirit Lake and Mount St. Helens is my life, folks. I've lived there 50 years. It's a part of me. That mountain and that lake is a part of Truman, and I'm a part of it. School children wrote Truman, asking him to leave the danger area. Sheriff's departments offered transportation, but Truman refused. As late as Saturday, May 17th, Truman confirmed he would not leave the serenity and beauty of his Spirit Lake home. Harry saluted would-be rescuers with a false sense of security. At 8.39 Sunday morning, May 18th, the mountain awoke with a roar. The greatly weakened and rapidly expanding north flank of the volcano blew out in a shattering explosion heard as far away as Vancouver, British Columbia, some 200 miles to the north. I was in bed this morning, I heard some, some rumbling, I got outside, stark naked and everything, I looked up there and I thought, it, I, thought I was going to see 25 on the Richter scale. I was scared, I was nervous. I, all I could see was, I live up there pretty close to the mountain, all I could see was the whole sky was just billowing and just puffing out with smoke and it had me nervous, I ain't kidding you. This explosion blasted nearly 2,000 feet off the mountain's elevation and about a cubic mile of earth straight into the air. The path of this hot rock a molten avalanche itself is going to knock down everything in its path and bury it. It's probably a frothy mass picking up trees, boulders, rocks, ash, dust, everything in its path flowing down the valleys with a great turmoil and a cloud over top of the escaping gases and dust rising from the material at probably very high velocities. I would guess on the order of well over 100 miles an hour that that pyroclastic flow is moving, probably somewhat slower than the blast velocity. It is ominous, and it's, it's right there, and we, we came to a screeching halt, turned the Jeep around, and we drove away at like 85 miles an hour with this gaseous ball just almost engulfing us. Did you smell it? Couldn't smell it. 
couldn't hear it, could see it. In seconds, those hot gases melted glaciers that had stood for centuries. Boiling water scoured the hillsides like a primeval tide, washing away tree trunks like matchsticks. Down into the valleys below came a crashing wall of water, logs, and liquefied soil, at times 25 feet high, sweeping away everything in its path. This first flood on the South Tootle came within an hour and a half of the eruption, and with little warning. There is a mudslide south fork of the Tootle River coming down the mountain right now. On May 18th, several large mud flows ravaged the Tootle River Valley. The first came on the South Tootle about 10.15. The second, several hours later, roared down the North Tootle. Then around 5.30, a mud flow much larger than any that had come before plowed into the Tootle and carried away the main bridge on the highway into Spirit Lake. Down into the lower valleys, 20, 30, 40 miles downstream came the floods. Property owners who had thought they were safe from the volcano's fury found their homes and lives washed away in seconds. By the hundreds, houses were washed off their foundations. Mud crashed into the front doors and pushed through ceilings. Cars and trucks were washed away. A freight train was twisted and pummeled by the deluge, riding a crest to settle far from its track. Many who had lived in this valley are still missing. Those who were lucky made it to higher ground. They at least escaped with their lives. Well, it's just taken out a lot of our land and our trees right down there below the bridge uh -huh. right now. And we're worried about our two houses. You know, we have two rentals down there, and we're worried about those. That they may get flooded mm -hmm. out? Yeah, if this big mud slide comes, it's right up to them now. Not only homeowners, but big business suffered huge losses. Logging was the economic base of this area. Weyerhaeuser, which lost thousands of acres of timber, also lost two logging camps. This is all that is left of the East District logging camp near Tootle. Throughout the day, the volcano churned up a continuous eruption of pumice, ash, gas, and steam. It sent up a cloud so dense it blotted out the sun. Climbing to 60,000 feet, the cloud would reach the jet stream and be carried across the country and eventually around the world. Scientists say it might lower the temperature worldwide by fractions of a degree. If nothing else, the ash particles made for spectacular sunsets. These are a series of pictures taken by weather satellites. On the first day alone, the huge ash cloud spread eastward over eastern Washington, Idaho, and into Montana. On the ground, it appeared to be midnight, although these pictures were taken in Yakima, Washington, just before noon. The heavy ash hurt the eyes and stung to breathe. It made driving extremely hazardous. As it fell, the sheriff urged residents to stay indoors, to have drinking water available, and not to use the phones unless it was an emergency. The ash fell 450 miles to the east in Missoula, Montana. There, residents wore protection over nose and mouth to keep from breathing the abrasive pumice ash. It was enough to bother those who were used to other forms of air pollution. For instance, these tourists from Los Angeles. We just came here to get a vacation and get some fresh air, but we came here at the wrong time. And then look what happens. It's worse than LA. The ash fell heaviest in Ritzville, Washington. Their motorists who had been traveling a state highway became stranded. Their cars' carburetors choked on the dust and sputtered to a stop. Local police attached odd-looking contraptions to their cars, snorkel devices designed to prevent ash contamination. It was days before the police would allow stranded motorists to move on, and then only in convoys. Okay, 30 miles an hour, stay out of the dust. When it's in front of you, slow down. If you do break down, when you're coasting, pull over the side of the road, okay? Uh, as soon as this truck goes by, going on. But for those living in the area, the arduous task of cleanup had only begun. They attacked the ash with shovels and hoses, 
scooped it up and dumped it into big trucks to haul it away and tried throughout to figure what it all would mean for the local economy. Ranchers were advised to move livestock into covered areas. Scientists were concerned animals could develop problems with their digestion if they grazed in ash-covered fields. Shallow-rooted crops such as wheat sustained damage from the tons of volcanic material that covered the landscape like a snowfall. Estimates of the damage to livestock, crops, and farmland would run into the hundreds of millions of dollars, and that is apart from the utter devastation in the vicinity of the volcano. Soon, there was a chorus of pleas for federal disaster relief from officials in Washington and Idaho. Those pleas were heard in Washington, D.C., and the states were declared federal disaster areas, making residents eligible for low-cost loans and for other assistance. But the federal saga was far from over. President Jimmy Carter announced that he would leave the White House and personally visit the disaster region. Primary politics couldn't get the president out, but the devastation of Mount St. Helens could. President Carter arrived in Portland three days after the eruption, but he didn't get his first look at the volcano until the next day. The president was determined to view the damage from the air, even though it was raining and his view would be obstructed by a 2,000-foot ceiling. On his flight to the Northwest, the president had been briefed aboard Air Force One by Agriculture Secretary Berglund and Interior Secretary Andrus. But later, the president would say nothing his advisors had told him prepared him for the utter devastation he was about to witness. The president's first hint of the disaster came as his helicopter started up the Cowlitz River, still choked by debris. The Cowlitz had returned to its channel, but the broad banks were tattletales of the river's destructive rampage. The scene changed radically as they approached the Toodle and drew closer to the volcano. Later, the president would describe what he saw. That there is no way to prepare oneself for the sight that we beheld this morning. I don't know that there's in recorded history in our nation that there's ever been a more formidable explosion. What happened apparently was a, was a natural explosion equivalent maybe to 10 megatons of nuclear bombs or 10 million tons of TNT that swept across first with a flash of, uh, of light and heat 800 to 1,000 degrees out 12, 15 miles away that instantly burned everything that was in direct visual sight off the explosion itself. This was later followed in two or three minutes by the pressure wave that travels at the speed of sound and then that was later followed by this enormous uh, gush of uh, liquid rock mixed with air and to some degree with ice that comprised one cubic mile of material. The absolute and total devastation of a region that encompasses about 150 miles. It's the worst thing I have ever seen. It had been described to me earlier, but it was much worse than the description uh, had impressed me. I don't know how long it'll take for that uh, region to, uh, to be uh, open, even for normal movement of traffic. Uh, enormous blocks of ice apparently are still covered by literally hundreds of feet of uh, fluffy uh, face powder type ash. And as that ice is melted under the hot conditions that exist, enormous cave-ins are taking place. 
Uh, steam is bubbling up. There are a few fires about. Uh, someone said it was like a moonscape, but it's uh, much worse uh, than anything I've ever seen, pictures of the moon's uh, surface. Fortunately, the number of people in that region were minimal, but it is, is, it is literally indescribable, and it's a devastation. In the hours after the May 18th explosion, rescue crews airlifted dozens of people to safety. Those saved included news cameraman Dave Crockett Jr. of television station KOMO in Seattle. Crockett had convinced his news director that something big might be brewing on the Mount St. Helens volcano. He'd set up a camera position at the very base of the volcano just before it blew. Other people trapped near the mountain on that fateful morning also walked or drove for miles to escape the superheated and poisonous gases, but many did not make it. As fewer survivors were spotted from the air, the task turned to the recovery of bodies. Many sightseers who had evaded roadblocks hoping to get that perfect view of the mountain paid for their curiosity with their lives. Two days after the eruption, geological observers reported sighting a natural dam at one end of the newly formed Spirit Lake. At first, the dam was believed to be holding back vast quantities of water, water that would be released if the dam broke and sweep the lowlands all the way into Longview and Kelso some 35 miles to the west. But while geologists speculated about the possibility of another major flood, Military pilots reported the water level behind the dam to be too low to pose any threat. Even so, local officials, still nervous over previous flooding, prepared low-lying communities for evacuation. And when President Carter visited the Longview area after his flight to the volcano, many of those he met with at this evacuation center were afraid to return to their homes because of reports a flood was imminent. The flooding also had washed tons of silt and debris into the mouth of the Cowlitz at its confluence with the Columbia River. It made the Columbia too shallow for shipping and temporarily closed a vital transportation corridor. Oh, that's some hot ground, boy. Get on. Jeez. It is alien terrain, this land near the Mount St. Helens volcano. A look at Earth in prehistoric times and therein may lie the key to the region's salvation. Tourists from all over the world will want to see this gigantic star for themselves, to tell their children and their grandchildren how they once stood in the shadow of a smoking volcano. Hank Rasmussen was away from his home on the South Toodle when the floodwaters hit that terrible Sunday. Later, the National Guard airlifted him to check on his home and on his dog Festus. Flight gave Rasmussen a chance to view the devastation for the first time. It's a sad thing, it really is. I love this country, you know, I'll never live anywhere else. And this is my home. I hate to see it happen to my home, you know. But there were many not so fortunate as he. They were the victims of Mount St. Helens' fury. The Seibold family, Barbara, Ron, Michelle, and Kevin, loved the mountain so much they would return at every opportunity. They took these pictures of their times together, a time to hike and to climb, to enjoy themselves. They were close to their beloved mountain, far too close when it exploded in fury. 
They died together in their car. Ron used to climb that mountain, and he, I don't know exactly how many times he climbed it, but um, then he got Barbara and the kids interested in it, and they liked to go hiking up there, and uh, lately they had been going back and forth so they could uh, see how the volcano was changing. I think that if they had picked a place to go, that they were probably in the, the best place, that they would be happy being there. And uh, that was their home away from home. And I'm sh that would have been their choosing to have been there. There was a memorial service for the Cybolds in the town of Tumwater, Washington, not far from their home in Olympia. So many friends and relatives were there, the chapel couldn't hold them all, and some had to stand outside. But they didn't seem to mind. Outdoors was a fitting place to remember a family who had so loved the woods. I think of death as a supreme tragedy. And often it is when a young life is taken. And then there was Harry Truman, the crusty 84-year-old mountain man too stubborn to leave his sanctuary beside Spirit Lake. Okay, here, here, he, here he wants to stay, and he's not going to leave, so and, and he's thanked us for our concern for coming. It's definitely and, a mistake. Somebody done it to cause trouble for me and the law and everybody else. But, now, somebody... Yeah. But you sure want to also thank these guys for coming well, up I do, to, boys, to I make sure that... Thank you, uh, sure. That damage, yes, I do. They, they brought their helicopter up here to see if you needed some help and get out. Yeah, the we just came up here to help you get out. That's oh, well, I'm not, well, here. thank you, folks. I appreciate that very much, but I, I have no intention to leave you, and I've never had any intentions, and that's what I knew it the last four or five days. He felt he knew the mountain too well for it to harm him, but he was wrong. His memorial would be the legend he would leave behind. <laughs>